Um, so, uh, as it says there, my name is Jason Ekstrand, um, and I'm going to talk, and I am from Intel in the upper left-hand corner, um, and I'm going to talk a bit about how to not write back-end compilers. Um, so, a bit about who I am for those of you that don't know. I think most of the people in the room know me by now. Um, I am kind of a middle-aged uh, free desktop developer. I've been around since 2013. Um, I was hired on at Intel in 2014, and since then I've gotten a few commits in Mesa. Um, and what do I work on? I listed the folders there. Basically, it's everything that does not have GL in the name. Um, so I don't really work on, I did a GL extension right when I first started at Intel, but I haven't really done anything in this main state tracker. I do very little in the GLSL compiler. I've never touched the preprocessor. Um, but basically, everything else is kind of my domain. I work all over the place. Um, today, we're talking about compilers, specifically back-end compilers. Um, so why am I giving this talk? Uh, so there's two primary reasons. Um, one is that we have a lot of new developers that have been added to the Mesa community in the last few years, and a lot of new drivers. Um, we've got the uh, people who are working on Fuidrino A2XX, um, which is the uh, Qualcomm GLES2 parts. We've got people who are doing the Pamfrost driver, which is for modern Molly. We've got the uh, we've got the Lima driver, which is for the GLES2 Molly 400 type parts. Um, we've got the Etnaviv driver, which is for Vivante. Um, and all these people are writing their own backend compilers, um, and they're fairly new to it. Um, and I was hoping that they could sort of learn from some of the mistakes that the more mature drivers have made when writing their backend compilers, and hopefully not repeat all of them. Um, you're going to repeat some, that's inevitable, but if you can avoid repeating all of them, that would be good. Um, also, I'm hoping this, that this can serve as a little bit of a retrospective postmortem for the mature drivers in the room that have been working on it for a while to kind of uh, look back and see what we did right, see what we did wrong, and see how we can better move forward. Um, so with that, let's start off with how to not write a backend compiler. Um, so the first thing you should not do in writing a backend compiler is say that everything backend specific should go in the backend. Um, so this was the philosophy that Intel had initially. And we have moved away from it for a few reasons. So um, a bit of history of, so um, a, a bit of history of sort of where Intel compilers have gone. So initially, we started between everything in the back end. Um, we had to handle structs and array of structs and all sorts of complex types in the back end. Um, all of our variable location lowering that all happened in the back end because we all came in as variables. Um, there was a little bit that the GLSL compiler did in terms of assigning locations, but then we had to crawl structs and arrays and all of that stuff to figure stuff out. Um, and there's a lot of stuff that we tried to handle. But over the course of the last four years, we've moved almost all of that stuff into Nut. Um, so today, uh, complex type handling is handled by GLSL to Nut. Um, IO variable location slot stuff is handled by no lower IO. Um, we have a pass that runs right before we go into the backend compiler to deal with Boolean cleanup on Gen 6 and earlier. Um, we have a pass that deals with handling large arrays with Scratch. Uh, the VEC4 compiler actually has that in the backend compiler, but um, for the Scalar compiler, we do it in no. Um, starting with Gen 11 and above, uh, we use Rob Clark's uh, fragment interpolation lowering pass that he wrote in no. Um, we recently we have to do a bunch of uh, format conversion code where we emit code gen for doing format conversion for storage images. Um, all of that has since been moved to Node. So we've been sort of gradually moving stuff into Node more and more. Um, and so our new philosophy is kind of to do as much of that lowering in Node as we can. Um, and there's a few reasons for this. Uh, one of those reasons is because Node has a really awesome optimizer, and if we do the lowering before we go into Node, then we can let Node's optimizer work on the lowered code and clean stuff up for us, which is really important. Um, another thing is that there's a lot of stuff that can be reused across drivers. Um, we can't write one backend compiler that works for all drivers, but a lot of the individual pieces that are needed for one driver are also needed for another driver. So, for instance, um, like I said, we were sharing the fragment interpolation code with uh, Friedrino. Um, I, I think we're also sharing like some clip plane lowering code and a few other things with some other drivers. And the things that we share with Friedrino might not be the same things that we would share with, say, a Radeon driver or a NVIDIA driver, but um, the, each of the individual pieces is frequently shareable. Um, 
Another thing is that w one of the things that people kind of ask commonly is, is it okay to have hardware-specific stuff in Node? And the answer is yes. We actually have quite a few Node-specific opcodes, uh, hardware-specific opcodes in Node. So for instance, uh, for our image load store loading, we have a load image param opcode. Um, it's specific to our backend, and then it gets turned into a uniform a descriptor load or something in the driver. Um, but it lets us lift a bunch of stuff into Node by just having this one intrinsic that is specific to our backend. Um, there's also IO3, V3D intrinsics. I think there's some Radeon ones. Um, most people have some intrinsic that they've added to Node at this point. So there is a lot that you can do with Node. If you just add just a couple little tweaks, then you can move a lot of stuff there, and it's a really nice compiler to work with. Um, and it can, it can optimize your shaders, the, the lowered code, very nicely, which has been a huge advantage. Um, next thing, in terms of, uh, so I just said not everything in the hardware um, needs to be in your backend. So the next question is, do you need an optimizer? Um, and one obvious answer is, yes, we need an awesome optimizer. Only the backend knows what it's doing. And we used to think this way. Um, so again, sort of looking at the history of Intel compilers, uh, when we initially landed the GLSL compiler, um, and it wasn't very long before we started writing optimizations in the GLSL compiler. Um, around the same time, uh, we started the backend compiler, uh, the, the scalar backend compiler. Um, and we started doing backend optimizations. And what we quickly realized was that a flat IR is way better for doing optimization, for doing certain classes of optimizations than a tree-based IR, um, just because of the nature of how particularly common sub-expressions work. And so what happened quickly after that was that um, Matt in particular, but a few other people, figured out that we can do lots and lots of optimization in the back end, and it's really awesome because it's a flat IR. Um, and so we did a lot of backend optimizations, and we got huge benefits out of it. And then Node came along, um, and Node did a way better job than either GLSLIR or the backend at most of these things. And since then, we have deleted most of our backend compiler optimizations. Um, there are a few left, but most of the stuff we've deleted. So we had an algebraic optimization pass, for instance. Um, and I think at one point in time, it was. 20 to 30 optimizations, and it's down to four or five. Um, there's other whole classes of optimizations that we've just completely deleted. Uh, we had some control flow optimizations, that they're gone now. Um, so we've gotten a lot of benefit out of Node and been able to get rid of a lot of the stuff from the backend compiler. And so the, I, the idea of backend knows best, we've really found out for most the large classes of things isn't actually true. Um, and I've had some debates with people in the Mesa community about, you know, our awesome backend versus whatever. And at least in our experience, just letting Node do most of your optimization really is the right choice. Um, OK, so Node has an optimizer. Do I need one? Um, there are some people, so we've been moving more and more stuff into Node. So the next question is, can I just do everything there? And the answer is no. Um, you do need an optimizer. Uh, if you don't have an optimizer, you will feel the pain. Um, in particular, there's certain passes that you need to just clean up stuff. Um, so you really need to have copy propagation, dead code elimination, common, common sub-expression sub elimination, um, and some register coalescing in order to just clean up the node into your backend translation. Um, otherwise, what you're going to end up doing is emitting macro instructions for everything, and you're going to have piles of moves, and um, there's just going to be a lot of extra stuff in your IR that doesn't need to be there. Um, you can probably do a decent job going from no straight into effectively assembly, but um, there's going to be stuff that needs to be cleaned up. Um, so uh, here we are. Um, so for instance, you, and you're also going to have some hardware specific stuff. So the, it's true that the backend does need to deal with the hardware specific details, um, but not everything is hardware specific. There is some stuff that's going to be though. Um, so for instance, a lot of hardware has flag registers. Um, flag registers are not a concept that Node has. Node has a concept of Booleans, but that's not really the same sort of set of constraints that you have in flag registers. Um, on Intel hardware, we have to do this annoying thing where we have to split instructions into multiple instructions in order to make our SIMD architecture work. So we have this 
architecture the dispatch is 8, 16, or 32 wide, and then the instructions are 4, 8, 16, or 32 wide, and some stuff can only run at certain widths, so sometimes we have to emit like 4, 8 wide instructions in order to get a 32 wide, and stuff like that. And that's just not something that we want to stick into Node. Um, I have, we have gone through the mental exercise of what would it look like if we added that to Node, and it's not pretty, and we're the only ones who have to deal with it, so we should not impose it on everyone. Um, so there's other things like uh, a lot of, a lot of hardware has some sort of a address register um, for doing indirect stuff. Um, that's not a concept that Node has really. Uh, we do have concept of indirect accesses on things a little bit, but not quite specific enough for hardware. Um, there's also stuff that requires texturing and memory access. Usually that stuff knows representation of it isn't quite what the hardware wants. Um, Rob has some ideas about possibly making it even closer for Fredino, and I think that it's on some hardwares, uh, depending on how things are set up, this is not true on Intel, but on some hardwares it may be possible to make the texture op code take like a VEX7 or something, um, where you pack all the parameters in, and you might be able to get pretty close to the hardware, but not all hardware is going to be that nice to you. So you're going to have, there's, the, the point here is that there's always going to be some stuff that you have to do in the back end, and you're going to need an optimizer in order to be able to clean that stuff up. Um, so our current philosophy at, these, at this point um, is to do as much optimization in Node as possible, do as much lowering in Node as possible, and then the back end compiler still has some optimizations, but it's mostly focused around just kind of house cleaning and and tidying up the resulting instructions. It's not focused around you know, arithmetic or code motion or some of these big heavy hitting passes. It's more focused around just taking what Node did, the already pretty good thing that Node did, and turning it into something competent in your backend. Um, so, and generally we're trying to keep the backend compiler minimal these days. Uh, it, it's, we still have some stuff in there, but it's not much. Um, so one of the other lessons to be learned here um, comes from Panfrost. So I, but when I did this talk, I sent out an email asking for people to give examples of mistakes that they'd made, that they were willing for me to admit in public. So um, one of the mistakes that Panfrost made early on was that the IR data structures were basically not designed to be mutated. Um, it was designed as a C data structure representation of basically assembly. And the end result was massive piles of pain when they decided they had to do optimizations. Um, so for instance, they didn't have any unification between vector and scalar instructions, and so everything had to be handled twice. It made sense if you were going to just go from no into this data structure into code gen, that was all fine, but the moment they started mutating things, it blew up. Um, also, data was frequently encoded in a way to make the final binary generation easy, so they were using hardware enums, and the hardware representations of things like masks. Unfortunately, those representations were not generalizable. So for instance, um, if they had an 8-bit instruction, the mask representation was different than for a 16-bit instruction versus a 32-bit instruction. And so suddenly, everything that dealt with masks had to think about the bit size of the instruction. And it was a disaster, and I think ended up with close to an IO rewrite for some of those cases. Um, so the lesson to be learned here is you're going to have to have an optimizer. It's, it's all well and good to start off with basically no into an assembler, but you're going to have to have an optimizer. So plan ahead a little bit and don't make data structures that you can't mutate. Seems like an obvious principle, but it, it's easy to forget that. Um, okay, so the next thing. Um, so what about control flow? Uh, it's really easy when you're working on a Glass 2 driver to think that, oh, control flow is something I can handle later, right? I, most apps don't need it. I can run all of GeoMark 2 without control flow. Well, the problem is that most apps aren't GeoMark 2. Um, and there's a lot of apps out there that do actually use control flow. And the bigger problem is that it affects every aspect of your IR. Um, it, it, things as simple as, is it a list of instructions or a list of blocks that contain instructions? Um, that's a choice that you have to make that if you don't make it right up front, 
you're going to have to go through and rewrite every single instruction walking loop in your entire compiler when you change it. Um, if you're doing SSA, which we'll get to that, um, suddenly you have fee nodes. That's not a thing you had before. So now you have to figure out how to handle those. Um, if you're doing scheduling, suddenly you have scheduling barriers at block boundaries that you didn't have before. And you have to think about that. Um, so you either have to think about scheduling in terms of scheduling within a block, in which case your scheduler now has a concept of I'm scheduling this range of instructions, or you have to make those control flow instructions barriers in your scheduler, at which point you need to have a concept of total barriers in your scheduler. Um, also, there's all sorts of passes like CSE that need to be able to think about blocks because suddenly you don't necessarily have dominance properties everywhere and so you can't just find the nearest definition and use it because that might not actually be the definition. You might have crossed a block boundary. Um, suddenly you need real data flow analysis. Uh, so there's all sorts of things that change the moment you add control flow. And so if you don't add control flow fairly quickly, you're going to find yourself in a world of hurt. Um, also, as much as this pains everybody working on Glass 2 drivers, you need to think about loops. Um, when you look at the edge cases and the things that make control flow hard, 95% of them come from loops. And so being able to say, yeah, I got control flow working in my driver, it's really awesome now. No, I haven't, I'm not passing all of the DEQP loop tests. Your compiler's broken. Um, and some of those breakages might be pretty systemic. Um, so I, I was talking to Alyssa and she described it this way. She said, there are two ways to write a shader compiler. Without control flow in 10 smiling days or with control flow in 10 may years. Except if you start without control flow and you try to retcon it, it'll be like 17 years and you'll be crying the whole time. Um, and this comes from experience. So when she was starting off on Pamfrost, there was uh, no control flow in the compiler and then she got to retrofit it and it was all sorts of fun. Um, so, Lesson to be learned here is do control flow up front. Don't, don't try and put it off. Um, another question. So should I use SSA? Um, and there are going to be some differing opinions. Daniel's already over there chuckling because he gave his talk earlier today about the great SSA backend. Um, and my answer to that question is actually probably not. Um, so SSA is really great for certain classes of things. Um, there are particularly optimizations like common sub-expression elimination or copy propagation, SSA makes almost trivial. Um, doing certain kinds of algebraic optimizations and things like that, SSA makes almost trivial. But there's other things that SSA actually makes very painful. So for instance, in Node today, we, whenever we do a control flow modification pass, um, we actually drop SSA, do the control flow modification, and then go back into SSA because it is easier than massaging all of the fee nodes and getting all of it right. Um, we have spent way too much time debugging loop unrolling, trying to figure out why we messed up our fees. And it is just way easier to actually go out and go back in. So there are, there are certain classes of optimizations where SSA is actually not your friend, believe it or not. Um, but the, biggest, the bigger thing is that it's actually harder to do properly than you think it is. Um, and it may or may not actually buy you all that much. So. With the ACO driver, I'm willing to give them a pass because there's certain things where, particularly their handling of uh, Booleans and flags, where they really do actually want to be SSA all the way into almost code gen because of the way that they have to handle um, combining flags back together. But um, in a lot of cases, it's not actually gonna buy you much. And the other, bigger thing is that going out of SSA is not as easy as it looks like it is. Um, it took me quite a while to get the no SSA pass, out of SSA pass right. And um, if you're new to compilers and you're trying to figure all this stuff out, that's probably not the best place to start. Um, if you don't have control flow, you haven't thought about the problem yet, so that's another case of retrofitting is hard. Um, if you have control flow but not loops, then I guarantee you out of SSA pass is wrong. If you have loops, it's probably still wrong. Um, and if you got it correct, it's probably not efficient. Um, it is possible to write a correct, efficient pass that handles loops. Uh, we have one in Node, you should use it. Um, I, again, I'm, I'm willing to give the ACO guys a pass because I think they do actually know what they're doing. But um, for a lot of these drivers that are bringing up compilers, SSA looks like a good idea, but it's likely to cause more pain 
than you actually want to take um, right out of the starting gate. Maybe it's something to consider once you get more compiler experience, but at the beginning, maybe not. Um, so, uh, so here's the main arguments um, that I've heard people make for why they're going to do their backend in SSA. Um, one is that it makes scheduling easier. And yes, it does, but only pre-RA scheduling and post-RA scheduling is super important for getting good performance out of a pilot pipeline processor. And so you're going to have to deal with multiple definitions and barriers in your back end anyway. Might as well just handle it. Um, another one is register allocation in SSA. And this is an interesting question um, because there are some neat things that you can do with register allocation in SSA. Um, it also has some issues, such as the fact that doing out of SSA post-register allocation can tend to leave you with a lot of extra move instructions, which depending on your architecture might be pretty close to free. It might actually be fairly expensive. Um, it's also really hard to go out of SSA properly uh, post-register allocation. Um, and while it looks like it gets you a lot, it's if you just use a good graph coloring allocator, it's probably going to get you most of the way there in a lot of cases. Um, another, another case that people throw up there is that it makes data flow analysis easier. And the answer is, yes, it does, but only because you haven't thought about the problem long enough. Um, you still have to handle all of those problems with your data flow analysis. I'm sorry. That's life. Um, you, you can't, you, you, not everything just becomes magically easier with SSA. Um, so, not to, to rain on the parade too hard, but it's, it, in my view, at least, um, trying to do SSA too hard in the back end too early is actually usually a mistake. Um, we have another case study here. This time it's from Friedrino, um, where Rob decided to do uh, SSA in the back end. Um, and he was doing arrays with no variables because he was actually doing indirecting, which I'm a little bit jealous of because we can't actually do indirecting that nicely. Um, and then he implemented loops. And like I said you know, a few slides ago in my control flow section, loops are where all the edge cases come from. And if you haven't done loops and you think, you've, that, you think that your SSA-based backend is awesome, you do not have enough knowledge to actually make that determination. Um, and the moment that Rob added loops, things started falling apart. And at this point, Fuduno uses the you know, SSA pass. Um, it's still pretty much SSA internally. Um, so knows out of SSA pass has this option, fee webs only equals true, which says leave everything in SSA that you possibly can and just generate registers for the things where you need register, where you need uh, multi-write in order to handle control flow. And so um, most drivers that call knows out of SSA pass do that, and then they still have quite a bit of the SSA information going into the back end, just not all of it. Um, Fuduino does that, our driver does that, I think most of them do. Um, and at this point, um, Fuduino is using no register instead of variables. Um, that simplified some things for them a bit. Um, and they actually, I think Rob said they actually treat all no registers like arrays. It's just a one element array so that it's kind of unified in the way that it's handled. Yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of like a registers, registers the only things that can be arrays. That, that seems like a good way of putting it. Um, all right, so next thing. We should just keep everything simple and do 32-bit types all the time. That's all you need to get started, right? Well, yes, but also no. Um, so this is another one of those things which can quickly infect your entire compiler. Um, in the 965 driver, we started off assuming that everything was 32-bit. And at the time, it was a reasonable assumption. Um, the hardware had theoretical support for 8 and 16-bit integers, but not really 16-bit floats. And everything in desktop GL um, was 32-bit. And even if you went to Glass, we just implemented MediaMP as a no-op. So it was a fine assumption at the time. Um, then Kronos came out with the 8 and 16-bit arithmetic ex extensions, and suddenly things started falling apart. Um, one problem was we didn't have a concept initially of the size of a type. This seems like a fairly obvious thing, but we did not have it. Um, 
we also did all of our register allocation in terms of entire 32-byte registers. A um, little bit of math tells you that a 32-byte register is a SIMD8 32-bit value. Um, so the moment we did SIMD8 16-bit values, suddenly those were half a register. And now what do you do? A register allocation doesn't understand half a register. Um, we have to do some striding stuff in order to handle register in order to handle certain region restrictions in our ISA. And previously those were reserved for a few special cases. Like we had to do some strides to calculate derivatives or handle the 16-bit float pack and unpack opcodes. But for the most part, we just didn't handle them most places in our IR. Um, and suddenly with 8 and 16-bit types, they became commonplace. And so all sorts of stuff broke because we discovered, oh, this pass does not look at strides and doesn't do the right thing, or this pass doesn't look at strides and doesn't do the right thing. Um, and there's a lot of stuff that we had to fix there. Um, we also have, theoretically, uh, instructions that support mixed type sizes. Um, that adds a bunch of additional restrictions in the hardware. Um, the other big one that was a problem was we made the assumption that if it's not a partial write, then the read matches the write. Um, and some of the Egalia guys are nodding their heads back there. <laughs> because we still haven't completely fixed this yet. Um, this kind of blew up in our faces. Um, so we made the assumption, like I said, that if, if I look at the register and I see that um, anything other than it writes every single byte of the register, then it's a partial write. But the problem is, like I said, there's lots of strides. Um, there's lots of stuff that aren't writing a full register because it's strided out. Or cases where you have a 8 or 16-bit type that doesn't actually fill a whole register, so it's counted as a partial write. And while our copy propagation and a lot of those other passes were correct in the presence of this, in the sense that they didn't necessarily break the shader, they just kind of stopped working. Um, and so even today, we have significant problems on our back end where 16-bit um, and 8-bit types cause copy propagation to just not propagate properly. Um, there's an outstanding MR to try and fix this, but everybody agrees that it's a little on the sketchy side and we've not actually landed as far as my memory serves. Um, there's also been issues with data flow analysis where all data flow analysis ever saw was partial writes and so nothing ever got killed and so all read, all 16-bit registers were live for the entire program, and so register allocation would fall over and we would start spilling like mad, even though we're not actually using that much data. Um, we added an undef instruction to help with that. It's improved the situation. Um, there's some other passes that fall over. Uh, the point is that um, this assumption, even after working on it for years, has, is still causing us problems on our back end today. Um, it was a good assumption at the time, but it's turned out to actually be pretty thoroughly flawed. Um, so how do we fix this mess? Um, in some sense, it should look like the, the easiest thing to do would be just chuck it and start over. And that's what we're doing. Um, so there's been a little bit of chatter about this on IOC, but I haven't I've tried to avoid media storms. Um, but for the last about six to eight months, I've been working on a prototype project to completely replace the backend compiler. Um, we're calling it IBC, which simply stands for Intel Backend Compiler, because it's, as, it's sufficiently uncreative that I could come up with it, and it is less dorky than no. <laughs> um, so like I said, I started about six months ago in March. Um, it's basically a from scratch code base. The only thing we're really reusing from the old backend at the moment is the final sort of assembly code gen part, um, just because I didn't want to deal with all the hardware generation stuff, um, and it deals with all of that nicely for me. Um, and we're trying to get it right this time. So well, I say right, but it's gonna, we're going to find out that it's wrong at some point in time, but we'll see. Um, so the code, IO, basic IO design is very heavily based on no. Um, we try to find a nice balance between uh, being close to the hardware and being uh, nice to work with. So one of the core design principles is that, for the most part, um, IBC instructions match the hardware instructions. There are a couple of cases where they don't, 
but it's basically only for things that have to deal with the address register because I didn't want to try and represent that in the IR. Um, and there was a few things that we tried to do very, very quickly. One was we wanted to handle SIMD32 up front because that was one of the things we didn't do on our old back end was we did SIMD8 and then I think SIMD16 might have been added. I don't remember. Um, actually, I wasn't there. Eric might remember if he's in the room. But um, So we're, we're doing SIMD8 through 32 up front. Um, we're handling scalar values, non-divergent values, um, and 8 and 16-bit types on day one. Um, so trying to design the IR so that it actually properly handles different data type sizes. And one of the other things that we couldn't do before, um, which the Radeon people are very used to at this point, is dealing with scalar registers where, um, in the case where all of the values in all lanes are the same, our backend couldn't do that. The hardware is perfectly capable of packing those things and getting a lot better register usage, but our compiler was not. And a lot of that comes back to this whole partial write thing. I thought about how to retrofit that into our old compiler, and I don't want to think about it anymore. Um, another thing that we wanted to do is actually register allocate flags and accumulators, because right now um, there are total scheduling barriers where if you have two instructions that use an accumulator, they can't move past each other. And um, if we register allocate, even if the restriction is that accumulated pressure is always less than or equal to one, that still allows us to move um, integer multiplies past each other and things like that. So that was another big design point that we wanted to have. Um, so the, the big philosophy behind IBC so far has been focus on the weird corner cases rather than focusing on GLMUC. Um, it's the less fun way to write a compiler in some ways because you don't get to see pretty pictures on the screen. Um, I just saw the first pretty pictures a couple of weeks ago. But it's more effective because we are focusing on getting the IR design right. Um, so when I was first working on this, I developed a small test suite. It's sitting in my GitLab called IBC Tests. And this is more or less the complete Git history of that test suite. And this is what I did for the first mm, two months or so of working on IBC. Um, so the first thing I did was I got you know, a working compute shader test. OK, great. That was pretty easy. Um, then I added support for um, integer equality and, bully and uh, BC cell because I wanted to make sure I got flags working. So flags was sort of step two. Um, then I added 8 and 16-bit math. OK. Um, I added a test runner script so that I could run my tests without running them one at a time. Um, next, I started working on getting Booleans working with Boolean arithmetic because we wanted to handle that differently than we handled it in the old back end. Um, did some subscripting. And then, like, about a month into IR design, I started doing subgroup operations. Why am I doing a Vulkan 1.1 feature one, week, or one month into IR design? And it's because it's another one of these things that impacts every corner of the IR. And I wanted to make sure that we got that right, because retrofitting it after I'd done a great master plan was just not going to work. Um, F sign was interesting because it tested a different corner case of flag register use. Um, then we did more subgroup tests. Some, then I started getting into control flow, a few more things. Um, and this is kind of where the test suite ended, and I started using DEQP instead. Um, but the, the core thing here is focusing on the corner cases, because the corner cases are the things that are going to screw you up later. And if you don't focus on them early, you're going to likely regret it. Um, so where is the prototype at right now? Uh, currently, it supports Vertex, Fragment, and Compute Shaders. That should sound familiar. Um, it supports the Vulkan driver and Iris. It does not support 965 because there's, mostly it comes down to resource binding. The models are just a little different there, and I didn't want to bother. Um, it may go to support I-965, or I-965 might just get sunsetted with the old backend. Um, currently, it's passing 95% of the Vulkan CTS. It's compiling 90% of the shaders in our shader database, uh, running with Iris. Um, it's currently at about plus 15% instructions, but most of those are likely moves because I have not come up with a competent plan for registered coalesce yet. It's on the very soon-to-do list, but it hasn't been done yet. 
Um, I have not done any significant benchmarking, and I would appreciate it if any journalists are reading this that they would not um, for the time being. But um, things are in pretty good shape, and we're gaining quite a bit of confidence about how well the IR is working. Um, there's still a lot of unknowns. Um, like I said, performance is still an unknown. I'm still in the process of getting pre-RA scheduling written. It doesn't support spilling, a bunch of stuff like that. But in terms of core data structures and how nice it is to work with and how effective it seems to be at handling all of the problems that we got wrong in the past, um, we're pretty happy with it. Um, so there's some stuff we're doing going forward. Um, it has a scheduler. It needs more work. Um, like I said, I haven't really gotten pre-RA scheduling figured out yet. Um, still need to implement spelling. That's not done yet. So most games will probably crash because it doesn't have a speller. Um, it, I need to figure out why it's generating piles of moves and eliminate them. This shouldn't be too terribly difficult. I think it just needs register coalesce, but I haven't done that yet. Um, need to do benchmarking, analyze performance, implement the rest of the features. It will all come. Um, but right now, we're, it's still kind of in the, I guess I would call it like public alpha stage maybe, where it exists, it mostly works, but there's still lots of work to be done before we can even suggest that users run it. So it's currently sitting um, out of tree in my personal GitLab, if anybody wants to poke at the code. Um, so kind of a recap um, of the whole thing. So first of all, do as much lowering and optimization in there as possible. Um, these are the things to do. So we're switching context. These are not the things not to do. These are the things to do. Um, you should do as much lowering and optimization in there as possible. Um, Write enough of an optimizer to clean up node to backend. Uh, you don't do write a whole giant LVM capable optimizer, but you need to write enough of one to clean up the node to backend. Um, don't do SSA in your backend unless you really know what you're doing and that you know that you want it. Um, there are some people who know what they're doing and know that they want, they want it, but most of the people who are working on Glass 2 parts, I would recommend against it. Um, and then don't avoid the complexity. Um, implement control flow and loops. Um, implement all the types and bit sizes you need. If you need to do medium P with FP16 on that hardware in order to get competent performance, implement it upfront as much as you can. Um, whatever other oddities your hardware has, whether that be flag registers or other weird things, just go ahead and implement those so that you get them, so that your IR you know is capable of handling it before it gets too big. Um, because the biggest problem with trying to retrofit any of these things into an already existing IR is just the sheer quantity of work that it takes to fix all of the issues and to even, some, in some cases, even get it building again. Um, so think long term, focus on getting your IR right. Don't just focus on getting GLMark2 running. It's tempting because it gives you pretty pictures, but you may hate your life afterwards. Um, so that's the end, and I think I managed to get it mostly within time except for the late start. So do we have any questions? Uh, do I really think you need CSE in the back end? My gut says probably. Um, and it, it kind of depends on how much work you have to do in order to clean up your code gen. So if you... If you are able to get your to get no close enough to your backend, you probably don't need it. Um, in our case, it's not optional because there's just so much garbage we have to deal with um, in order to do particularly the SIMD splitting, where um, we do end up emitting quite a bit of code. Um, it, so it, it kind of depends. I, it's probably not the first optimization to write in your backend. Um, but it's one that I think is likely to be needed. Other questions? Go ahead. Can sometimes doing things the wrong way still be better than giving up halfway? <laughs> Can doing things the wrong way be better than giving up halfway? Uh, yeah. I mean, sometimes... It kind of depends on what your objectives are. Sometimes you're just trying to get things off the ground, and getting things off the ground is a good thing. Um, I did not implement control flow as the first thing in my IR. In fact, about mm, two months into the project, I completely deleted my old control flow and wrote brand new control flow handling. 
Um, that's just kind of the process that you go through with a code base like this. But the big thing is that you want to do those mutations while the code base is small because otherwise you have piles and piles of refactoring pain and you become more lazy and less likely to actually make the changes that you need to make if you write a bunch of optimizations before you handle control flow. So it's, yeah, it's, it's not that you shouldn't start off with a prototype that just gets you off the ground. You should, because you have to, to get going. But if you're trying to plan long term, then handle things before handling them becomes too painful. I am not seeing any other hands. So I think we'll call it done and move on to the next person. <laughs>